everyone. Sitting here on this cold day, uh, playing a little classic Miss Pac-Man. Uh, it's kind of a rip-off version because she doesn't even have a little, like, uh, bow on her head. Um, but I suppose we should get to work. Um, okay, so just like any of you, let's get uh, distractions. Plays way, we'll, we'll get you ghosts a little bit later, Miss Pac-Man. Um, all right, let's uh, clear out our browser here. Um, don't need to be looking for those uh, teaching jobs in warm climates. Um, let's get off the MySpace. Just checking out a little uh, big bad My MySpace page, right? Like, uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, so we better get out of here. Better close down my Facebook page, my Instagram, my Twitter. Um, just pretty much all of those distractions. Uh, and let's... Work. All right, uh, here we go. Um, we're we're bundled up, uh, crazy. I'm all toasty warm. Am I? Am I? Uh, back in my teaching recliner. I'm gonna come. So uh, we know it's approximately minus 24 degrees, and everybody's talking about how oh my God, it's colder in Cedar Rapids. But you know, let's put this in perspective. I did find a place. That's one degree colder currently, uh, and that's Sashlaka uh, in Siberia, uh, way the hell up here. So, hey, at least we got that going for us. And um, we know it could always be worse in European history. I mean, you could be coming back from a humiliated defeat in Moscow, um, being all sad Napoleon with all your frozen comrades on the ground, ready to make a fort out of them so you can stay warm. Um, so, we're all in our warm houses and you know we're not Napoleon uh, so that's pretty good so we're gonna get back uh, to it I'm gonna try not using the mic uh, today so hopefully the sound is a little bit better you won't get as many peas out of me uh, as we did yesterday I thought that was a slightly bit annoying but we're ready to do fireside chat number two got the fire going this morning we're gonna talk a little German unification got my cow uh, she was really into that Italian unification, so she totally came back uh, again for another lesson. So let's get rid of me. Don't need to see me every once in a while. I might pop up. Uh, you know, maybe sometime I'll pop. Hey, there I am again. All right. Uh, no, let's hide me. Okay. So hopefully you're ready to continue our conversation and our comparisons uh, of the Italian and German unification. Um, so again, I think you should need your key concept workbook that we had with you yesterday, page 76. We're working on key concept 3.43 with that unification of Italy and Germany. Uh, bring your T-chart that you started yesterday, pull that back out, uh, and away we go. Um, all right, we are going to be perfectly stereotypical again. Um, notice we went from spaghetti to a plate of sauerkraut. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about German unification. Before we can do that, we got to do a little bit of background on the chancellor, the man, the architect behind German unification, and then that is Otto von Bismarck, right? How do we get to our Otto? We've got to figure out what is happening with our Prussian kings, right? Um, Frederick Wilhelm IV, um, finds himself going a little, some people consider it a little bit of crazy. Um, basically, towards the end of his reign, he was kind of losing it uh, a little bit, and most everybody just kind of assumed he was, he had done gone cuckoo. Uh, what we now know is that uh, he was basically having almost like a series of strokes. Um, from what I can research, it was almost like he had some varicose veins in his brain uh, it was causing him to go a little bit of crazy. So anyway, bye-bye Frederick Wilhelm. The new leader, the new king, the Kaiser of Prussia is Wilhelm uh, the first. That is, uh, you know, he comes in uh, and he is the one that is going to appoint, uh, despite the protests of his wife and his son, he's the one that brings our Iron Chancellor. Uh, our Bismarck. You notice he's on my list. He's one of my uh, favorite characters in European history. We're building quite the list. He's no Johannes Gutenberg, uh, but he's pretty cool. And look at that hat, man. That's got that pointy hat. That's always a, 
a cool hat to have. All right. A little background information on Otto von Bismarck. I'm going to fly through this relatively fast. Again, you can pause it if you're just really into Otto von Bismarck. Um, I've always said I've, I've got uh, Bernie's Mountain Dogs or the dogs I've always had, but I, I do have a history teacher goal of someday owning three German Shepherds. And if I had three German Shepherds, I would literally call them Otto von Bismarck, um, just because I think that would be a lot of fun standing outside screaming Otto von Bismarck, get back in the house. Um, that would just crack me up. Uh, and then we'd go around terrorize French poodles around the neighborhood. Um, yeah, history teacher jokes. They're hilarious, right? Um, again, might get some distractions coming in. Uh-oh, I got a distraction coming in right now. I think I'm getting attacked by a cat. Um, oh, well. All right, so Otto von Bismarck. Um, key things that you need to know about him. He's a Junker, which you know is a Prussian noble. All right, so more than likely he's going to come at things from a very conservative standpoint. Um, but just like Cavour, he's a realist. You can't be that Metternich conservative, um, but he is definitely uh, comes from that background, wants to protect uh, the monarchy, wants to protect uh, a, a noble, kind of a noble way of life. So just kind of keep that in, in the back of your mind that uh, at his heart, he's more conservative than he is anything else. His early political career uh, put him in some interesting uh, situations. He was very much, this is that conservative coming out, very much opposed to the revolutions of 1848. Um, he also develops this realist concept that if you're going to get a unified Germany, it's going to have to come from a Prussian standpoint, not an Austrian standpoint. He's pretty an anti-Austrian, as we will see. A couple key things that are going to help him politically later. Um, he does serve as an ambassador to Russia and to France and to England. Whole time he's there, picking up really good information. What makes Russia tick? What makes France tick? What makes England tick, right? All of this information he's gathering in his early political career is gonna come back to benefit him, right? That's that real polo -tic. He's gonna use what he has learned to serve his advantage in his unifying of Germany. All right, so, uh, and then eventually he finds his way uh, into being the chancellor. Now, in your notes, you had um, this concept, blood and iron speech, and uh, the textbook kind of referenced it a little bit, but I want to make sure that um, you kind of know this uh, pretty soundly. When Bismarck makes his first speech as chancellor to the Prussian parliament, uh, he comes out and he's got this very famous phrase in it. He states, Germany is not looking to Prussia's liberalism, but to her power. The great questions of the day will not be decided by speeches and majority decisions. That was the mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by iron and blood. Again, you should see that conservatism come out, that anti-liberalism. Um, when he's speaking of speeches and majority decision, that's a slam on the liberal take on how a government should work, right? Um, and in his mind, they do more speaking than they actually do anything. What Heath says, or what he implies, that Prussian strength is going to come from their iron, their industrialization. Prussia is leading the German Confederation in industrial output. That's that economic strength that he will come. And because he's a good Prussian, he's always ready to reference the blood, the use of Prussian military. Right, so from, from his very first speech in Parliament, he's setting the stage that if German unification is going to be accomplished, it has to come from Prussia, and it's going to come from their economic, industrial output, and their military strength. Okay, so you see this little uh, graphic organizer should look very familiar to the one that we did with Italy. Um, we're going to put uh, very specific terms up here again, and remember our goal is when we see how Bismarck is going to use all of these very specific events, we want to be able to then compare them, which ones 
jive with uh, Cavour? Which one differ? Where are the similarities? This is going to be an excellent piece of information, or all sorts of great information to use uh, within body paragraphs of an essay comparing Cavour and Bismarck. Okay. Again, I'm going to try to pick up the speed a little bit, but as you can imagine, um, sometimes I just get uh, talking and ooh, look, I can move myself around, right? I didn't even feel that move. Uh, and I can just go on and on and on, right? Uh, especially the fact that I have no audience except for my dog sitting from in front of me. And yeah, that dog looks about as interested as uh, some of you in first hour when you're half asleep or whatever. Um, the biggest benefit between my dog and you in the back of the room is like my dog doesn't have a posable thumb, so he's not on her, she's not on her phone. Um, so let's try to go uh, maybe a little bit quicker in this. Okay, let's start with the Zolverin. You read about the Zolverin quite a few weeks ago, right? Um, the Zolverin, we're going to use this as a comparison with Cavour's liberal reforms improving the economic status of Piedmont. The Zolverin is a trade alliance uh, amongst many in the German Confederation. Remember that German map, it's coming up here a little bit. We got all these small little German states or whatever, right? Um, but they understand that if they come together economically, they will be a little bit um, more of a force to deal with economically on the continent, right? Uh, and so Otto von Bismarck, and the, with the use of the Zolverin, continues, right, uh, Prussia on a strong economic path. And again, remember that's important. If your country or your state is economically stable, you've got a little political capital that you are going to be able to use when you start wanting to go on other political uh, adventures, and in this case, unification and especially with Prussia, with war, all right? So again, the Zolverin, that's a use that uh, Bismarck is going to continue uh, Prussia economic strength, right? Um, man, this video stuff is hard. Okay, uh, remember this is the iron blood, it's Prussia. You've always fundamentally um, thought of Prussia and military strength to the best of your ability. Um, so just remember, again, he's going to always continue to put money into his, his military as well, um, building that pride, especially remember after the Crimean War, your military strength becomes your, a big part of your foreign policy. Okay, the first major incident, we're going to get fast forward here a little bit, we're going to bring up the map, right? Uh, and this, as much as my voice is going to annoy you, this is going to annoy you even more, which is awesome, right? Um, Bismarck's real politique technique is just to kind of use this pointy hat that he has just to agitate situations, right? Uh, if we are going to unite this German confederation, he quickly realizes that if Prussia is going to lead the way, we're going to have to deal with Austria, right? Um, if you can remember back from yesterday, a key thing that he picked up after the Crimean War is that Austria lost a good alliance with Russia, right? And so he kind of understands and he sees the political makeup and he's going to manipulate it knowing Austria no longer has the undying support of Russia. So it's a good time to pick a fight with Austria. And that's what he's going to do. In his first adventure, he's got to try to unite these areas in here uh, against Austria. And so he sees a political situation with some German Confederate uh, uh, areas up here known as Schleswig-Holstein, right? That's really good German pronunciation. Um, I would yell it a lot louder, but there's other people in my house uh, and they don't really care. Um, so, whoop. Here comes our agitator, right? And so what he does, he allies with our Austria or contacts Austria and says, hey, we've got a situation up here with Denmark. Denmark has taken over, at, at the time Denmark was all the way down here, right? Um, and he is looking with Austria and saying, hey, Austria, 
we've got a connection here, right? Schleswig and Holstein sounds very German, doesn't sound a lot of very Danish. Uh, and so he wants to work with Austria and say, we should kind of push Denmark out of here and take over the territory that Germans rightfully own. Austria agrees, but Austria is concerned like, well, I don't necessarily want Prussia to have control over this because if Prussia gets too much power in the northern part of the German Confederation, they are going to be a threat. So Bismarck just says, hey, let's just jointly rule this new territory until uh, they can get their feet underneath them a little bit, right? And so Austria agrees. Austria, I believe, has control of Schleswig, Prussia has control of Holstein, uh, and everything's good. And this is exactly what Bismarck wants, right? Because now, very similar to what Cavour did once he knew that he had the Treaty of Plombieres, he's got an angle against Austria, right? And so very similar to Cavour moving his troops around annoying Austria, Bismarck doing the same thing uh, with Austria. Oh, we got to make that sound a little bit louder there. That's not quite annoying enough. There we go. All right. So he just keeps annoying the situation, right? We'll just kind of let this go until you're ready to declare war. Remember, this is what I really like about this is this is one of those sounds that the old guy can't really hear. Uh, and it drives teenagers' brains crazy, right? Uh, so the whole point of this, I want you to get to a feel how annoyed Austria was getting, right? So Bismarck just made it difficult for Austria to control their areas. Oh, I don't know what happened. Some telegraph lines got cut. That was weird, right? Uh, messages getting from Austria to their territory. They just didn't quite get there, right? Um, some newspapers are printing some anti-Austrian uh, propaganda. That's weird. I don't know how that happened, right? So to the point where he's just annoyed Austria so much, right? And he backed him in the corner just like Cavour did. And so Cavour wanted a specific thing. And so here's the thing. Austria, annoyed by Prussia and Prussians intervene, uh, intervening in an area that they had a right control of, eventually decides enough with that we got to sustain our empire we got to show everybody who's boss and so we are going to declare war right uh and that then is the seven weeks war remember the key part of what i said austria declares war right so just like in the italian unification process they've annoyed austria to the point you backed them into the corner austria has to act, right? They can't look weak on the international scene. And Prussia, Cavour, knows that their military strength is superior to Austria, right? And if they just invaded Austria on their own, then all of a sudden they look like the aggressor. But now, with Austria declaring war first, they're just like, hey, we're just defending ourselves and defending maybe some of our friends here in the German Confederation. And so, uh, the war happens, and it's an onslaught, right? The, Austria is defeated in, I don't know, roughly, um, yeah, about seven weeks, right? So Austria really, after the Seven Weeks War, Austria kind of, uh, they're done being a political power in our course. They'll pop back uh, a little bit later, but um, they definitely take the set back seat uh, to Germany, especially a unified Germany, okay? So... Now, with the defeat of Austria, you get all of these other light purple areas now coming under control of a North German Confederation, right? A key step in German unification because that is going to be led by Prussia, right? You guys still with me over there, right? Not, not enough, not going to your other tab on your Instagram or your MySpace. You guys thought MySpace was fake until you saw it, didn't you? Now. Now you're trying to get back on it. Okay, um, just want to make sure we're checking in to you. Now the fun begins. Um, and I, we got to go a little bit faster here a little bit. So we've got the unification started in this area. But you got these southwestern German states. They're not quite sure. They've been a little bit more pro-Austria down here than Prussia. And they've definitely got some concerns 
about a unified Germany being too Prussian, right? So Otto von Bismarck's got to figure out what is a way that I can get these southern states to unite under me. Who would be a common enemy on this map that they would have a problem with, right? You're already taking care of Austria. Who else is here? Yeah, France, right? This is a major annoyance, right? And so we're going to try to manipulate a situation and pick a problem. France, right? Oh, here he comes, right? So just like we do with Austria, we're going to annoy the hell out of there. Oh, here's an even more annoying sound. China, 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 China. China. <laughs> oh, I could listen to that for a hundred times, and it still makes me laugh. You go uh, over to China, 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 Oh, we're never going to get this done, man. Like, now you know why it takes me three class periods to get anything done. Okay. All right. China. I know China very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, one of the other terms that you had in your notes that was not in there, um, which is a key piece of evidence on how... Otto von Bismarck uses real politique is what is known as the M's dispatch. All right, so we're going to take a look at this M's dispatch and figure out how he does it, right? Uh, if we were in class, you would all be getting a copy, but since we're not in class, let's go find a copy. I have it here somewhere. Um, let's take a look in my notes. Click over here. I got to go. Um, it's a pretty confidential uh, doc. Oh, let's go into my top secret stuff here. All right now, um, don't tell anybody anything that you're going to see here. Right? Um, let's see where it's at. There's the M's dispatch right there. Don't worry about anything else that you see. I'll deny, deny, deny. Okay. Here is the infamous M's dispatch. Okay. Um, we're going to try um, to take a look at this, um, and I'm going to just let this run here a little bit, and I would like you to take a look at this. Um, I may stop this video here uh, and come back with a second one because we're pushing a little bit long here. Um, so let's just do a quick little pause. Okay, I paused, but the video didn't pause, so you have no idea what we'll pause. I actually put another log on the fire. Okay, there's a little background information that I'm going to... You don't need to know all of the details, um, but there is something important. King of Spain died. King of Spain died, did the one thing that a king should never do. He died without an heir. So there was a question on who should be the next king of Spain. A member of the Prussian royal family, the Hohenzollern family, there was a a cousin somewhere down the line, uh, was the potential king of Spain. France totally threw a fit about that, right? Um, that shouldn't surprise any of us because if you um, were going, if you were France, you definitely don't want the king of Spain right, right down here being from the same family as Prussia, right? Because then you're going to be surrounded. This is not a new problem. We've had this issue in Europe before, right? Uh, so France was putting a lot of pressure on Prussia to make sure that their Hohenzollern uh, king uh, or family member would not be the king of Spain, right? Uh, and so Kaiser Wilhelm, he's on a little bit of vacation. He's chilling in this place called Ems, right? While he's there, a French ambassador comes and has a conversation with him. There's a lot of political things going on in the background, um, but the, the French government wants the Prussian king to come out and publicly state that he would not support one of his relatives becoming the king of Spain, right? That's what France wants. So that meeting occurs, right? Kaiser Wilhelm sends a report back to Bismarck. He's his prime minister. He's his chancellor. He's got to know what's politically happening, right? So Bismarck gets this very confidential, don't tell anybody that you're seeing this, he gets this 
dispatch, right? And if you can kind of take a look at it, it's pretty boring, right? There's not much in there, right? Count Benedetti, that's the French ambassador, uh, intercepted me on the promenade, me being Kaiser Wilhelm, right? Uh, and so in this conversation, the French ambassador has the audacity to, in a very impromptunate manner, um, say that I, Kaiser Wilhelm, will bind myself in perpetuity to never again give my consent of the Hohenzollerns to become the king of Spain, right? So the, the French ambassador is basically asking the king to, let's hide myself, you can see my eyes. Uh, he's basically saying, you're going to come out publicly and never support a Hohenzollern in becoming the king, right? Uh, that kind of annoyed Kaiser Wilhelm, right? And so he decided, in view of the above-mentioned bans, not to have any more conversations with the French ambassador, right? So this is what Bismarck gets. This is what really happened. Bismarck, real de politique style, comes out and says, you know what, I'm going to use the press to my advantage, uh, normally, a conservative is all about censoring the press, but now in real politique style, I'm going to manipulate the press. Uh, and so he leaks uh, a document, he leaks an edited version of this telegram to the Prussian press, and that will eventually find its way into the French press as well, right? So again, what you're going to get here is just one little paragraph, but this little paragraph is going to start the Franco-Prussian War, right? How? So, basically what he's stating in this new edited version, it states, after the news of the renunciation of the Prince von Hohenzollern has been communicated to the Imperial Germany government by the Royal Francis government, the ambassador, the French ambassador, in Ems, made a further demand on His Majesty the King that he should authorize him to telegraph to Paris that His Majesty the King undertook for all time never again to give his assent should the Hohenzollerns once more take up their candidature, right? This line right here is going to totally honk off Prussians, right? Because here is a lowly French ambassador making a demand on the King of Prussia that he should authorize him to telegraph to Paris, right? So it's basically the French ambassador telling the Prussian king exactly what to do. So that's going to annoy the Prussians, right? How dare some little French ambassador tell us what to do? This line then, because it's Bismarck, now I got to figure out how am I going to annoy the French? His Majesty the King thereupon refused to receive the ambassador again, and had that latter informed by the adjunct of the day that his majesty had no further communication to make to the ambassador, right? So now here's the Prussian king standing up for himself, but now he has offended the French ambassador. He will no longer communicate with the French ambassador, right? So now when that is leaked in the French press, you've got all the little Frenchies uh, so offended, right? How dare this Prussian king turn away our ambassador, right? So tensions between France and Prussia are starting to mount, right? Um, and because of this kind of slap in the face and some movement uh, along borders, right? Like tensions are just starting to rise uh, between these two countries. Um, he, uh, Bismarck is going to get just like he got with Austrian right yep Let's um, yeah we're not going to do china anymore right uh you get the franco-prussian war right so again through military strength through potent political manipulation you have prussia manipulating a situation just like they did with denmark and schleswig um and got the seven weeks war we're going to manipulate a political a simple little political discussion between an ambassador and a king. We're going to manipulate that. We're going to move some troops around uh, so much that France is annoyed with Prussia uh, and Napoleon III, who wants to show kind of his, I'm not, you know, a weakling, uh, declares war on Prussia and thus begins the Franco-Prussian War. Very similar to this one, Bismarck and the Prussians have superior military strength, right? And, and so this war lasts a little bit longer than seven weeks, um, but it is a successful war for Prussia and France is defeated. They march uh, right across the borders 
uh, they find themselves marching all the way to France, right outside of Paris. And then in a just complete, they could have taken Paris, uh, but just to kind of send a message, they just surround Paris and just bomb it for a couple weeks. Um, not all out bombing, but just enough uh, to be annoying. Another thing that Prussia uh, and their military leadership did that was really, really smart uh, in the weeks leading up to the war, they had a bunch of spies disguise themselves as landscape painters, right? Uh, and so they were going to go in and um, under the thing that we just want to paint the beautiful French countryside, but really what they were doing uh, was marking out where the rail lines were, where French troops were, right? Uh, totally snowed the French. And so when the war started and France declares war, um, a lot of it is over this disputed territory right here, uh, Prussia comes in and the route is on, right? So once France is defeated, you've got these southern German states now taking a look or like, hey, we're going to get some of this land that we've lost to France back. We like that. We like Prussia. We are now okay with having a unified Germany, right? So, and result, again, through the manipula manipulation, we get uh, a unified Germany. And that takes place, if you notice this picture, and if you read the description in the book, the book does a really nice job. Uh, the author of the textbook does a nice job explaining this famous painting, all right? Um, but notice where this is taking place, right? You should recognize that this is the Hall of Mirrors. Um, so there's a lot of significance going here. We are going to declare the German state, but we're going to do it in Versailles, right? Here are all of your leaders of your German states, right? Notice all dressed in their military uniforms, kind of showing everybody from this point forward that Germany is going to be a military power. There's that strength, right? There's that blood in the iron um, that, that goes, right? Here is your version of Victor Emmanuel of Italy. Here is Kaiser Wilhelm, who is now your first Kaiser uh, of Germany. And so your eyes kind of want to go over here, but the author uh, or the painter uh, does something very specific. Here's my man, our man Bismarck, right here in the middle, dressed in white. So there's your vanishing point. We're bringing your attention here, right? Everybody is pledging their allegiance to the Kaiser, but yet our eyes go to Bismarck because he's the one that has manipulated this situation. He, just like Cavour, has done the political work to bring about this unification. Now, unlike that political cartoon that we looked at um, with Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel with Cavour not in the picture, Bismarck's all about being front and center, right? Uh, if you notice what he's got in his hands, there's his Prussian helmet, all right? He's clutching the papers uh, that will proclaim Germany to go, right? So there's a lot of symbolism in this picture. There's a major symbolism in, in declaring a unified Germany in Versailles. It's basically meant to send the message um, that there is no more Viva la France. France is no longer your political power uh, in Europe. It is now all about Germany, right? So I'm hoping that if you uh, weren't distracted by my distraction, you now have, where are we back to our T-chart? I could easily could have put this in a better spot. Um, I'm hoping you now have enough stuff written down here with Bismarck. Maybe you just made those two graphic organizers, right? Um, but I'm hoping that you now see similarities between Cavour and Bismarck, right? What did Bismarck do that was a little bit different? A little bit more military strength, right? Um, both used wars, Prussia used war to their advantage a little bit better, okay? So take the time, look back and forth, think about if I was going to write a body paragraph, all right, maybe I'm writing a body paragraph that has similarities. Here's what Cavour did, this is how, this is what Bismarck did, and most importantly, this is why they're similar, okay? In a, an effective essay, you can't just tell me this is what Cavour did, this is what Bismarck did. You got to have that connection sentence. That's where I'm testing your ability as future historians to take a look and uh, make those connections, right? Next body paragraph might be on differences. Here's what Cavour did. This is what Bismarck did. And this is why they're different, 
all right? So um, this one went a little bit longer, all right? Um, had a little bit more bells and whistles in it. Uh, so now you know how Germany was unified. Now you know how Italy was unified. Now can you effectively compare those two, right? If you were required to write an essay analyzing the similarities and differences in the methods used by Cavour and Bismarck, I'm hoping this video and what you have in your workbook uh, will help you get that done, okay? Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you and talking to an empty room, All right? My fire's still going. Hopefully we will see you back in class. Um, should we bet? What do you think, tomorrow? I don't know, still looks a little bit cold. Uh, but remember, still colder in Siberia. So we got that going for you. All right, um, so that's it for me. From my cow over my left hand shoulder, um, I'm going to go, I don't know, do something else. Maybe have another cup of coffee or seven. Later, dudes. <laughs>